Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Illinois Arts Council Agency, and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Lincoln at Lincoln College and the Lincoln Heritage Museum. It doesn't seem possible that it was seven years ago that this uh, museum opened. Um, it's no longer a new museum, but they do have a couple of new items that you might want to see. One is an immense United States flag that was used during Lincoln's first campaign, and they actually wrapped him up in it. It's been restored. And the other is a collection of Civil War letters from a local family, 112 letters which recount that period of history. So come along. Our first stop at the Lincoln Heritage Museum is one of the newer acquisitions. Olivia Partlow, that, that you have gotten, and this is really precious, and you're very proud of it, and you should be, because this flag from 1860, I believe, right? Yes. During the campaign, Lincoln's campaign for his first campaign for president, was made locally here in Logan County, and it's been kept all these years, and what got tattered and torn, and, and a group brought it to you, and you're able to restore it, and this is what you end up with, and it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, I'm so happy with how it turned out. So Lincoln College um, first acquired the Middletown flag in the 1990s, but it was in such rough condition that we were only able to really unravel it one time just to take a look. Because you were afraid it would fall apart, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. We didn't want to you know, risk damaging this amazing artifact. And so it wasn't until just this past summer, summer of 2020, um, that we were finally able to get it restored. Um, it was about a three month process, wow. um, but we we're so happy to finally have it yeah. on display. Who restores something like this? How do you find a company to do that? Well, it's definitely specialized. Uh, we went with a textile conservation uh, company out of Indianapolis mm -hmm. and so I, I drove the flag up. It was a very nerve-wracking oh, uh, bet. drive um, <laughs> but we made it there safely and it took about three months. They washed it um, very delicately. <laughs> There's stains um, all over it that they were able to get out pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, then they added a fabric backing and several different pieces of fabric. So they matched the color fabric of the color of the flag. So under the blue, there's blue fabric. Uh -huh. Under the red, there's red. Well, we can see over here some of the areas, especially on the blue, you can see where where it really needed some help here. And those, those areas have been reinforced and, and, and reassembled again. Absolutely. So, yeah. And if you look at this star right there even, um, it was barely even hanging on, mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. now it's totally secured and we're able to have it on display. And you've got for it in a climate forever. controlled area. This museum is made for you know items like that. Yes, and the display case it was actually designed um, by some people in Indianapolis as well from the Indiana War Memorials. They have hundreds of battle flags from the Civil War, the Revolutionary War, all um, different yeah. wars. And so this is their design um, that we're following. So this case was actually constructed by a local Logan County resident, Jason Hoffman. And he put it together using the design plans from the Indiana War Memorials. Mm -hmm. And after it was created, um, a group of women actually from Logan County were the ones to so the fabric backing, so not the actual flag, they didn't touch the actual flag, um, but the fabric backing they sewed to the form core that's behind it. And it was really a perfect moment and taking the flag full circle to see this group of women sitting all around the flag, um, discussing mm -hmm. normal everyday things, just how I imagine uh, the ladies of Middletown in 1860 would have constructed the flag. This was made for what one of his rallies in Springfield um, during the 1860 campaign? Correct. It was for his August 8th, 1860 campaign. August 8th. Okay. And, and the people that were supporting him at this time, they were called Wide Awakes. Is that right? Correct. The Wide Awakes. It was mm -hmm. kind of like a grass move, uh, grassroots movement, um, almost paramilitary. They had uniforms. They would have rallies. 
Um, and so they just, it was a, mostly young men um, that mm -hmm. supported Lincoln and supported the Republican Party. Let's go over here because there's some, uh, there's some pictures of that year. This would have been in Springfield. There's the Springfield headquarters, which of course the old state capital. Um, and then the wide awakes down below, they're, they're yeah. described there as, and that's the, the group that you were talking about, which not only supported him, but made this flag and apparently wrapped him in it during this time. Correct. So he was not originally supposed to be wrapped in the flag, mm -hmm. uh, but the Middletown Wide Awakes, they had this huge carriage. It could fit about 25 men. So they used that carriage to go all the way from Middletown mm -hmm. to Springfield, about 15 miles. Um, and they had a 20 foot pole and on that pole was this flag. Mm -hmm. And so originally, you know, the flag was just made to decorate their parade float and they participated in the rally uh, and they went to put the flag away. It was getting kind of windy and they were worried yeah. about, you know, it getting tattered. So they were going to put it in an old stable at the state fairgrounds. and. That was supposed to be the end of it, mm -hmm. uh, but then a, a group of men came in and they were trying to find a carriage um, for Abraham Lincoln to use to make his way across the other to the other side of the state fairgrounds. Um, there were no carriages available uh, except for the one that the Middletown Wide Awakes had. So they asked that his name was uh, Ray Byrne. That was who was taking care of the flag mm -hmm. of. And so they asked if they could borrow the carriage uh, to use for Abraham Lincoln. And he said, of course, <laughs> who would say no to that? Yeah. Um, and so Abraham Lincoln sat on this flag and then it was also kind of like draped over mm -hmm. his shoulders sure. uh, as he made his yeah. way to make that speech, yeah. um, a speech that he wasn't even supposed to make in the mm -hmm. first place. But the crowd was just cheering and begging for him to yeah. come. Yeah. Make a speech. This museum is also proud to have a couple of other pieces of artwork that are their artifacts from from the 1860 election, and, and and this is this is an original made in Logan County painting on material on on material, right? Yes. And then, of course Lincoln and Hamlin, who was his vice presidential choice, right? Yeah, and so this banner, um, along with the other Nation's Choice banner we have, were used at the same rally, the August 8th, 1860 rally, um, and along with a couple other wide awake rallies in Logan County. Mm -hmm. And so the story is they like to use this larger banner out front because it had the likeness of both Abraham Lincoln and Hannibal ha Hamlin. Um, most of the time, the banners just had Lincoln, so mm -hmm. that was kind of nice for the public to see both. And, and this is in the condition you received it. So this has stayed in really good condition all through the it years. It has, yes. It doesn't need to be rehabbed condition. like the flag did. And then there's another one of him here in the 1860. And this is also a painting on material. And uh, it's, of course, like you said, it doesn't include the vice president. <laughs> it does not, yeah. no. Um, but these were both created by the same um, two men, uh, Dr. Reuben Neal and then his uh, nephew, who is Reuben Neal Lawrence. Um, so these two men hand painted the banners and they used them in the wide awake rallies. Mm -hmm. The nephew, uh, Reuben Neal uh, Lawrence, he was actually the commander of the Middletown Wide Awake Regiment. Um, kind of a funny story, he would uh, lead their rallies with brandishing a Revolutionary War sword. Um, not really any connection to Lincoln, um, but kind of just an mm -hmm. interesting tidbit. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, um, the sword was actually owned by Mad Anthony um, from the Revolutionary War. He was one of the generals. Oh, they would okay. call him Mad Anthony. Mad. Okay. But <laughs> now, this is, this is one of your latest uh, acquisitions, but you also have an exhibit of Civil War letters, which is um, extensive, and they're from a local family. And you've got that exhibit out as well. And before we see the rest of the museum, I'd like to go take a look at that, yeah, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Olivia, the Hawes Collection is a collection of letters exchanged between the Hawes family and their sons who were engaged in the Civil War on the Union side. What makes this collection unique or important? Well, it's important because it's a Logan County family. So it's right here at home. But what makes it really unique is that there are letters both from the soldiers fighting but also the family at home. It wasn't as common to hold on to the letters written by your family. 
Um, so most of the Civil War collections, Civil War letter collections, have only letters written by the soldiers. Uh -huh. So the Haas collection is so, so just unique and fascinating because you get the full picture of what was going on with this family. You know, the hardships that they were dealing with at home. Um, their mother got sick at one point, so you get the father writing to tell their, his sons that their mother is sick, and then you get the worry mm -hmm. sent back. Um, and it's just an amazing collection because of that back and forth. Mm -hmm. 112 letters all preserved, and then in 2012, this Mr. Hawes decides it's time to, to donate this to where, where they can be taken care of forever. And he chose your museum to uh, to bequeath them to, which is a which is a terrific a terrific thing to do. Yeah, we're so lucky. The collection was preserved for generations, and then um, James Hawes he found it in one of his uh, in his mother's house, um, and all the other siblings, you know, were saying what they mm -hmm. wanted from her house. Um, and he said, you know what, I'll take the history. And so he took mm -hmm. this awesome collection of letters and we were so lucky that he chose us to donate them to. And over the course of a few years, we've transcribed all 112 letters um, and actually created a book with all of the transcriptions oh, that's wonderful. to give to the Haas family. We can look in, inside, these, uh, inside these windows here and see what you've done. You also have car artifacts from the Civil War, of course, and, and the sword on the right is particularly important, isn't it? Yeah, so it's actually a sword cane. So you can see it could be com the blade could be completely hidden, mm -hmm. um, but it was actually a Confederate sword cane. But it was given to James Ewing, uh, one of the Hawes sons, during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And of course, you see some quotes up here from George Hawes. He's in the field in April 12, 1862. The dead are lying thick for miles around. I, it's, it must have been so gruesome. I asked you, Olivia, if we could pick out a couple of examples of, of some things to read, and you chose one. Well, let me read mine first, because, cause, because mine talks about, um, about how these, these particular soldiers on the Union side just found slavery to be so abhorrent, and it gives a reason why they actually found a reason to write. So, and this comes from J.J. Uh, Ewing to his parents in June of 1863. No one who has not been in the midst of slavery can have any just conception of the wickedness connected with it. Though the most gigantic rebellion is now being waged that the world ever saw and that our nation is again to be baptized in blood, yet I have no doubt but we will come out of the contest a wiser and better people with purer government, free from the clog that has always impeded our progress. This from a fellow in the field who's been fighting for a couple of years, I mean, that, 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 that's, that's, he's a very good writer and a very intelligent guy. I guess the whole family was smart. Yeah, right? well, his father was a school teacher, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you picked one back from one of the sisters to one of the brothers who was fighting. And this is interesting because this comes right after the president was assassinated. Yes, this is one of the most unique letters. It's describing Abraham Lincoln's funeral train going through Atlanta, Illinois. And it's so unique because we get lots of accounts of the funeral train going through large cities, but you don't have so many of it going through small towns and mm -hmm. a small town where the residents actually knew Abraham Lincoln. So this is by Louisa Ewing Shores, May 3rd, 1865. My dear brother Henry, I will have to write to you again about the great loss that our nation has sustained in the death of our much beloved and justly honored President Abraham Lincoln. He is now in Springfield. It has been published for some time that the train that bore the body would pass through this place at six o'clock this morning. The people of this place had a meeting Monday evening, May the 1st, to make arrangements to receive the train. So yesterday they went to work. They built an arch over the railroad and trimmed the arch with black crepe, black muslin, white muslin, and evergreens. The arch is high enough for the cars to pass under. Then they went to work and trimmed the depot the same way. 112 letters like this between family members, not only from the viewpoint of the soldier in the field, but from the family back home. It's remarkable. It definitely yeah. is. Yeah. Okay, Olivia, we have just entered 
a new, a new time. Yes, yeah. I like to call the elevator our time machine. Okay. So now that we're out of our time machine, it's April 14th, 1865. And you'll notice we're right outside of Ford's Theater. Mm -hmm. This is an interesting setup because you're starting this immersion tour with his shooting with him being assassinated. Right, you might think there's not much else to be told. Yeah. Um, but the tour is really, really unique. It's set up almost like a life review. So we'll go in, we'll see Abraham Lincoln be shot by John Wilkes Booth, but then the rest of the tour all takes place in that nine hours in between him being shot and actually dying the next morning. So during that nine hours, uh, we use our imagination to mm -hmm. think of what he, what could have been going on in his mind, a life review. Mm -hmm. So as we go through, we'll go through his childhood, adolescence, um, early years, mm -hmm. his, throughout his different career paths. Until his eventual death. Until we get to his eventual death. After you. Sure. So we'll make our way right through Ford's theater. And you'll see here, we can witness Abraham Lincoln be shot by John Wilkes Booth. Mm -hmm. And then we make our way back in time even further to February 12th, 1809, the day that Abraham Lincoln was born. Mm -hmm. He was born to Nancy Hanks Lincoln and Thomas Lincoln. Unfortunately, his mother uh, passed away while he was still a young boy and his father remarried Sarah Bush Johnston Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And Abraham Lincoln was really close to his stepmother. She said that he was the best boy she ever saw. And she really encouraged his love of learning and reading, while his father, on the other hand, um, wanted him to do hard work and wanted him to be a hard worker. Didn't want him wasting that time reading right. those books. <laughs> yeah, and like, like over here, I mean, he seems to be getting a great amount of pleasure out of that. Absolutely. Um, so they were bo he was born in Kentucky, moved to Indiana, and then near Decatur, when they came across the state line to Illinois, they were near Decatur. Yes, as a young man, his father, Thomas, moved the family to Illinois. Illinois had only been a state for a few years, so there's lots of opportunity that his father wanted to latch on to. Mm -hmm. And after going to Illinois, he, Abraham Lincoln didn't stay with his family. He set out on his own. And the, one of the big things that he did was take a flatboat all the way down the Mississippi to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And it was on this trip that he made money for himself for the first time. And so that was a really big deal. Before he would always give his money back to his family, uh, mm -hmm. but this time he got to hold on to it for himself. It was also a very important trip because it was the first time that Abraham Lincoln witnessed slavery firsthand. Uh, he stayed right across from a slave market in New Orleans, so he got an up-close view of slavery at mm -hmm, that time. Mm -hmm. So it formed an early opinion for him. He probably had heard of slavery, but had never encountered it. Uh, Absolutely. Probably not in Indiana or Illinois anyway. No, and honestly, he hadn't really even encountered a big city before, mm -hmm. so it was, it was an eye-opening experience. Yeah. Yeah, and that flatboat that you were talking about, people that know the New Salem history know that that's how he ended up there because he got one stuck near there. Yeah, on one of his flatboat trips, he got the boat stuck in New Salem. He ended up having to stay the night and he met a lot of the townspeople and he decided that when it was time for him to settle down, that New Salem was the place for him. Mm -hmm. So he had several jobs in New Salem. He worked as a postmaster, he owned a general store, he racked up some debt with that. Mm -hmm. um, he also was a captain in the Black Hawk War. Um, he has a funny quote, he fought in the, well, fought in the Black Hawk War, but he says um, his bloody battles were with the mosquito. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and people should know that there's a wonderful state park at New Salem that recreates that village, so they should they should check that out too. Absolutely, you can uh, see actually the store that Abraham Lincoln owned in mm -hmm. New Salem. And during that Black Hawk War that I mentioned before, Abraham Lincoln made some friends, and one of those friends was John T. Stewart, who would later become his law partner. And it was Stewart that um, encouraged and gave him, Abraham Lincoln the idea to become a lawyer. Okay, and then he had uh, various other, but everybody knows about Herndon, and that, and their law office is, is still there and restored uh, yes, for people to go through. Yes, you can tour that in Springfield. In Springfield, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And then he was a circuit rider. A lot of people don't know what that means, but that means lawyers who 
would go around to these various courts, these rural courts, and they would represent people that they probably hadn't even met yet. You know, but their the court date was there, so he would go and, 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 and hear these trials. Yeah, and that's where a lot of the people, like everyday people around Illinois, met Abraham Lincoln and became his supporters. Because we didn't have, you know, TV or things like that to entertain ourselves with. Yeah. So a big source of entertainment was going to the local county courthouses and watching trials. So it was at these small county courthouses all around the 8th Judicial Circuit that the people of Central Illinois really got to know Abraham Lincoln as a man. Mm -hmm. And it was a way to make, he could make money. That was really one of the only ways he could make money because sitting in his office in Springfield where I wasn't going to do much. So he had to go <laughs> around where the business was, right? Yes. Although there were times that he would barter for his services. So I'm not sure <laughs> uh -huh. how much he made then with the chicken. <laughs> well, it's worth something. <laughs> so over here we show Mary Lincoln, as well as a few of his other love interests. We talked about New Salem before. Um, over here we have a depiction of Anne Rutledge, mm -hmm. which many believe was Lincoln's first love. Mm -hmm. And we have no photographs of her, I guess. No, huh? yeah. no. And I wish that there we had proof of that, but it'll be one of those, I think, questions for yeah, forever. It'll always be a mystery. <laughs> yep, yep. Because he wasn't going to talk about it. No. And downstairs, we actually have the desk that Abraham Lincoln and Ann Rutledge studied on in New Salem. Okay, so we know about Mary Todd Lincoln. We don't know about Mary Owens up in the corner up here. Yeah, Mary Owens uh, was Lincoln's first fiance. Uh, she and Abraham Lincoln got engaged while Lincoln was still living in New Salem. Uh, they just, they kind of fizzled out. There just wasn't a lot of compatibility there mm -hmm. and they ended up breaking it off. And it was after he moved to Springfield that he met uh, Miss Mary Todd. Mm -hmm. And his family, of course, and there's a lot of tragedy in his family because I think he lost two sons, one in Springfield and one in, in, uh, in the capital. That's um, correct. Um, Eddie and Willie both uh, died before Abraham Lincoln did. And Willie died in the White House. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, uh, Tad Lincoln, his youngest son, he also did not um, survive to adulthood. He died just at age 18, mm -hmm. but that was after Abraham Lincoln's death. Mm -hmm. So the political climate um, in the 1850s and uh, was getting really heated with things like the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, the northern states were very upset about that and Lincoln in particular was as well. Mm -hmm. In 1858, Abraham Lincoln ran for Illinois Senate against Stephen Douglas. And that's really what took Abraham Lincoln from this small country lawyer that just those of us in central Illinois knew to a nationally recognized politician. Mm -hmm. Stephen Douglas was already well known um, nationwide. So when Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas took on a series of debates, the Lincoln-Douglas debates, um, that really skyrocketed Abraham Lincoln to the national front. Books of their debates were circulated by both the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, so people all around the nation read those transcripts. Mm -hmm. We saw a little bit about this, his campaign downstairs at the, when we began about the wide awakes and, and his supporters. And this would have been the year that he actually uh, actually won the, won the election, I guess, 1860, huh? Yes, in 1860. Um, some of those, uh, his law partner and Leonard Sweat, another lawyer on the 8th Judicial Circuit, and Judge David Davis, a judge from the 8th Judicial Circuit, these were his supporters, big supporters for the 1860 election, and he met them while traveling the 8th Judicial Circuit. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, then he, he, he says, Mary, we are elected. Yes, and so... And, uh, and he gets ready to go to Washington, and everybody, I think a lot of people are aware that he left from Springfield, and the station's still there that he departed from, and it looked a lot like this. Yes, and it was rainy that day, um, and they left on February 11th, uh, 1861 mm -hmm. and the path that his train took to Washington DC is actually the path that his funeral train would take back to Springfield oh, to bring his okay. body. How fitting, how fitting. 
And then of course, he spent almost five years, more than four years anyway, here in this office. Now the Lincoln bedroom, but this was his office. He <laughs> yes. liked this. Yes, his office, the cabinet room, um, is right here. On the desk, we've got the, a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, there's kind of a funny story with that. When Lincoln went to sign it, he was worried that his signature might look shaky. And not because he was uh, you know, questioning the proclamation, but actually the opposite. He was worried that people would think he was questioning uh, the proclamation uh -huh. if his handwriting was shaky. Didn't want any doubt about it, right? No, so he, he was nervous to be about sure that. sure that this is what he wanted to do. Well, so we've, now, we've seen this character before. Yes, John Wilkes Booth. We are leaving the past, so now we're in our present day 1865. So moving back towards Abraham Lincoln's last moments. Very effective, very effective. And then, of course, in here there's a video that accompanies this, but, uh, but this, of course, is the site uh, of the morning after, and I assume that he has just, he has just passed. Yes, Abraham Lincoln passed away on April 15th, um, about a little after 7 a.m. at the Peterson House next door to Ford's Theater. Mm -hmm. mm. And then you're able to wrap it up with, you know, we all have a separate idea of Lincoln, but these descriptions pretty much fit what most people think of him, and this is, this is a great way to try to sum up his life. Definitely. We like to focus on the things, the events, and the character traits that made Abraham Lincoln the admired man he is today. You know, his time in Illinois, his time on the Eighth Judicial Circuit, his time working as a postmaster, as a surveyor, all of those little things that made him into, you know, everyone's favorite president. Yeah. Thank you, Libby. Thank you. The Lincoln Heritage Museum really is something to see, and you can see it Tuesdays through Fridays from 9 to 4, and on Saturdays from 1 to 4. There is an admission. With another Illinois story in Lincoln, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Illinois Arts Council Agency, and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you.